So, I see some people coming in, and I expect more people to keep coming in. So, welcome to Lito Hall. Uh, good to see some familiar faces in the audience, probably the, the die-hard believers in uh, freedom and democracy in the Middle East. So, uh, our time is limited, and I don't want to pretend that I'm an expert in Afghanistan. Uh, so let's move directly to the real experts. So we're blessed to have with us two people who know Afghanistan, who have been in Afghanistan, and who also know the West, which is also important for our discussion. So we have Dr. Greg Mills. For people who know, Greg Mills needs no introduction. He has the Brantos Foundation in South Africa, and he's also engaged in uh, many think tanks in Europe and the world, such as the Royal United Services Institute, and also, Greg has served four deployments in Afghanistan, right? Greg, as the chief advisor to the commander of the NATO forces there. Also, Greg has written this book, which I would like to showcase, and it will actually make a great gift to people who want to understand Afghanistan. So, and we also have Ali Nazari, who is the head of foreign relations and diplomacy of uh, the National Resistance Front of Commander Massoud and the president of the Massoud Foundation uh, in the USA. Right, Howie? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, the panel's title is pretty direct, pretty straightforward. We're talking past, we're talking present, we're talking future. What went right and also what went wrong. So, first question goes to Ali. So, to quote Richard Nixon, what's the state of play in Afghanistan? Where we're we heading to? Thank you very much, uh, Basil. It's great to be here uh, with, with my good friend, uh, uh, Greg. And uh, the situation in Afghanistan right now is very dire. Uh, the country since August 15 um, has been experiencing um, uh, different types of crises. Uh, we have a humanitarian crisis, which is the worst humanitarian crisis that Afghanistan has experienced in its recent history. Uh, we have a political crisis. The country is in a state of anarchy at the moment. There is no law and order. There is no government to represent Afghanistan. Uh, and third is a security uh, crisis. Um, Afghanistan's borders are not being controlled. Um, there is an influx of terrorist groups coming into Afghanistan, and the country risks in becoming, uh, once again, a sanctuary for international terrorism. Going into the humanitarian crisis, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of misconceptions, misunderstanding when it comes to the current situation with the humanitarian uh, uh, situation, with the starvation that the people of Afghanistan are experiencing. Many in the international community believe that, well, it's a lack of assistance, a lack of cooperation uh, in Afghanistan, that starvation has happened, it has increased uh, throughout the country. Uh, however, what we believe is that the reason why there is a humanitarian crisis today is because a terrorist group, a crime syndicate, has come into power, has hijacked the whole country, and is starving the population. A group or a combination of different groups under the umbrella name of the Taliban, there's different factions, if there are different groups with, with uh, uh, different goals and aims, and, 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 and um, they have, some are uh, drug cartels and, and drug kingpins, some are terrorist groups with a radical Islamist ideology, with a jihadist ideology. Uh, some joined the Taliban umbrella uh, group uh, because of they felt marginalized in the previous government. Uh, so there is different factions um, that are fighting over power at the moment, and this is why there is a state of anarchy. Um, and they don't have the intention and will to bring law and order into the country, to build state institutions, to serve the people, and to address uh, the economic and the humanitarian situation at the moment. Their so-called prime minister uh, said that our duty was jihad. It's not to feed the people. It's God's duty to feed the people. And so 
people should pray to God. That's, that's their mentality. And so what we believe is, as long as there is a terrorist group, as long as there is a group like the Taliban in power, Afghanistan will uh, continue having a humanitarian crisis. And the political crisis as well, which is uh, the country lacks any state institutions, lacks a government, a bureaucracy at the moment, uh, which in turn has created the security crisis, which is um, allowing um, different groups, criminal groups, uh, to operate throughout the country. It's allowing international terrorists to come into uh, the country right now. And there is an influx of foreign fighters from the Middle East, from North Africa, from Central Asia, South Asia, around 13,000 foreign fighters have come into Afghanistan. Uh, they're building bases, they're building training um, uh, camps, and, and they're affiliated with Al-Qaeda and ISIS. So this is the situation that we're facing today, and unfortunately, uh, it's, it's, it's not something that we expected. So, and what's your vision of Afghanistan? What Commander Masood thinks that should be done in order to improve things there? Well, the reason why uh, Ahmad Massoud, the leader of the National Resistance Front, stayed in the country while the president left and the whole political elite left and went into exile was because he believed that the people of Afghanistan will not accept a terrorist group as their representatives, and this is what has happened. Uh, and he believes that uh, the people in Afghanistan, they support democracy, uh, and the vision that the National Resistance Front has for Afghanistan, for Afghanistan's future, is to reestablish democracy, to free the people from the suppression that they're experiencing today, to gain Afghanistan's independence, because Afghanistan has lost its independence. It's, in reality, uh, <coughs> a country, a protectorate of Pakistan at the moment, because the Taliban is a proxy of Pakistan. They are being funded and supported by Pakistan. And we believe that, yes, there was a democracy in the past 20 years, but it was a flawed democracy. We need a democracy based on our own traditions, based on Afghanistan's realities. To establish social justice, Afghanistan is one of the rarest countries in the world. It's a country made up of ethnic minorities. It's a heterogeneous country. It lacks a majority. So no ethnic group constitutes a majority, and it's because of the arbitrary boundaries that were uh, uh, drawn up by uh, the British Empire and the Russian Empire in the 19th century. So in a country like Afghanistan, you cannot have power concentrated in one city and in one individual. We saw the, what happened to the democracy of the past 20 years. Power was concentrated in Kabul and in the hands of one individual, which was the president. As soon as the president left, he fled the country, we saw everything collapse like a house of cards. And people felt that they weren't part of decision making and policy making. This is very important in a democracy. For a strong democracy, for a functioning democracy, you have to establish social justice. People from all over the country, from all ethnic groups, from all sectarian groups, from uh, both men and women, uh, from all religions, they have to perceive themselves in power. So we believe that a reformed democracy with a better power sharing deal is the right vision for Afghanistan's future. And the people of Afghanistan support this. The people of Afghanistan are adamantly and vehemently against uh, the Taliban, and they support uh, our efforts at the moment. Do you think the, the Taliban government is a stable government? First of all, they aren't a government. Uh, there is no government or state in Afghanistan. Uh, the country is in a state of anarchy. Yeah. Uh, and this is what the Taliban, uh, what, what the people uh, understand, but that's what the region has realized in the past six months, and the international community. This is why no one is recognizing them as a government. And at the same time, the Taliban themselves, there is another misconception, misunderstanding, that they're a cohesive group, they have a leader, and that they share the same vision. That's not the, uh, uh, the case at the moment. It's a highly divided group. They lack a leadership. Their so-called leader uh, was killed or he died uh, around two years ago. Uh, the so-called Mullah Haibatullah hasn't been alive 
for two years. Pakistan's ISI is concealing this, uh, and, and just how they concealed Mullah Omar's death uh, uh, years ago. And there's factions fighting over power and on the role of leadership. So they believe that, uh, so at the moment, the factional fighting is increasing. The rift between the different factions of the Taliban is deepening. And so as we move forward, as every day passes, the Taliban divide is widening, they're disintegrating, and this will give us and the people of Afghanistan an opportunity to reclaim their country and to liberate their country from this oppression. So thank you, Ali. Let's move to, to Greg. So, you know, Greg, I was watching an interview of Dr. Kissinger with William Buckley, and he was saying that the scope of policy making is to exert some kind of conscious control on future events. So, if we accept that, do you think that the fall of Kabul is a lot about the West's failure to implement a proactive policy in Afghanistan? That's a great question. Um, I'll answer it in a long way around, if I may, um, Please, partly because I still bear the scars of all the time that I spent in Afghanistan, and I need the catharsis. But I think the first point I would make is just how quickly the world has shifted from thinking about Afghanistan 24-7 to not thinking about Afghanistan at all. Occasionally, it pops up on our news feed in terms of women's rights, but uh, really, it's, it's remarkable how it's sort of gone from the consciousness of, the, of, of those who supported Afghanistan in, in, in their endeavors uh, over the last 20 years. And it's, of course, been uh, increased by what's happened or, or accelerated by what's happened uh, in Ukraine. It's also a reminder not just how quickly the news cycle shifts, but how liberalism is a fragile concept that we presume that the world is progressing inexorably towards a better state. But actually, uh, the fall of Kabul, the rise, the return of, of the Taliban, and now what's happening in, in Ukraine is a reminder that everybody has to be an active participant in this process. This is not going to happen without people being at the center of it. I do think the, the West needs a very hard look at itself in terms of its foreign policy as to why uh, Kabul fell and why 20 years of extraordinary investment in financial terms, $3 trillion, extraordinary investment in terms of lives, 10,000 Western lives, several hundred thousand Afghan lives uh, really came to naught. Um, or, or did it come to naught, but largely has seemingly in political terms come to naught. I think the first of these is the solution, as ever in all of these conflicts, is political. And we, we the international community, uh, largely try to see this in terms of a technocratic exercise, a military exercise, one that could be driven by aid policies, one that could be driven by military engagement. And as Lakhta Brahimi put it, the failure to make peace with the Taliban back in 2002 was the original sin. Um, the failure to include them in a peace process when they were weak uh, and, and, and fragmented uh, led us inexorably 20 years later to the conclusion that uh, occurred in, in August last year. The second and related point is that if you're going to do operations like Afghanistan, you need to think them through to the finish. And I do think that the West largely made it up as it went along. And in some cases, the, the United States' international partners only were there because they wanted to influence the United States. But by being there to influence the United States, they'd already lost their leverage at that particular moment. So. Nobody had really thought this through as to what the moment of exit looked like. How were we going to finally get out of this process and instead retreated while simply handing over the, the country uh, to the Taliban, accelerated by the Trump presidency, but concluded uh, by the Biden pre presidency. 
The third aspect is, and Ali has referred to this, is that regional processes are crucial in making peace. Now, peace happens when you have the parties at the negotiating table realizing that there's more to be gained by ending fighting, fundamentally, than by continuing with it. It's, it's the fundamental basis of a peace process. And to do that, you need have to have them being pushed to the negotiating table. And the, the huge disjuncture in the peace process in, in, in Afghanistan was that one of the major regional players in Pakistan had no interest after a certain period of time, around 2006, in a peace deal in Afghanistan. They had a different game to play. And it was a long game. Uh, it went on for more than a decade, but ultimately delivered what they were seeking. It may not be what they want, ultimately, but certainly what they were seeking. I think, fourthly, there's a, there's a question to be asked about the appropriateness or not of the type of assistance that was uh, given to Afghanistan. I think the military assistance, and we can talk about this in more detail, was ultimately wholly inappropriate. It was creating a mini-me America with uh, helicopter-supplied outposts to a country that had none of those resources. It, it, what it really needed was training, and uh, uh, the sort of strategy that meant that it could rely much less on logistics than the United States ultimately constructed. I think fifth and the second last point I would make is that aid policies were wholly inappropriate. The traditional way of a country getting wealthy is through investment and trade. And that didn't happen at the micro level and at the macro level in Afghanistan. You had people who were f famously uh, and fundamentally uh, disinclined to business in charge of huge volumes of money and financing, which didn't go about creating business in the traditional way that businesses operate, which is on a, a profit and loss basis. Um, and as a result of that, you ended up with extraordinary aid follies. Bost Airport, for example, in Lashkagar, saw one flight a week uh, at one point. Uh, Kandahar Industrial Park, which had no electricity uh, connected to it until 2010, when I was uh, asked by the commander to go and make sure that there was an electricity provision to the industrial park. And the, the final point I would make is, there's an axiom in remedying states, which is that the period of recovery is at least as long as the period of decline. No country breaks that rule. So if you've been hammered down for 20 or 30 years, it's going to take you 20 or 30 years to get back up to where you were before it all started. And because of the failure to observe these fundamental six tenets, tenets about the way in which state recovery occurs, you had in, invariably what you had in Afghanistan. And let me just end with, with two brief observations what this means. I think it's had a significant impact on Western credibility. Now, to an extent, this is going to be dependent on what happens in Ukraine. If the West does with, with Ukraine as it did with Afghanistan, after a couple of months, it'll get distracted and something else will pop up and there'll be a big shining something over there that'll that'll cause uh, the, the United States and others to, to go off uh, their current mission. It's had a tremendous impact on deterrence, uh, Western deterrence in particular, and Western credibility for partners elsewhere, including uh, in my home continent, Africa. I mean, do you really want to throw all your chips into the basket of the United States after seeing what happened in Afghanistan? Probably not. You're going to hedge your bets a little better with China, with others, with Turkey, and other big players in Africa, Iran included, rather than simply go with the Western model. And I do think that it's going to see um, Ukraine in particular, but a focus on domestic development elsewhere in the world, uh, particularly with interest rates going up, 
is going to see a diversion of resources away from conflict hotspots because of the, uh, the uh, issue of Afghanistan. That doesn't include uh, Ukraine, I don't think, for the moment. But you're going to see far more domestic focus over time and far less of these sorts of expeditionary missions uh, that we became used to in the first 20 years of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. So I'm very tempted to ask a lot of questions, including how comes that so many, so smart, and so experienced people made so many mistakes, but we're running out of time, so I'll move to Ali and ask. So I will play a bit the, the devil's advocate, and I will ask, so why Europe and the West should care about Afghanistan, and why the international community should engage, especially with ANRF and Commander Massoud? Well, uh, what happens in Afghanistan doesn't stay in Afghanistan. Uh, the West uh, made this mistake uh, three decades ago. In 1992, when the communist regime in Afghanistan fell, and the groups that were being backed by the U.S. for a decade, all of a sudden the U U.S. and the West as a whole uh, abandoned Af Afghanistan, allowed a vacuum to be created, and that caused Afghanistan to become a sanctuary for international terrorism. For around nine years, from 1992 up to 2001, Afghanistan was ignored by the West. And we saw the consequences. It wasn't consequential only for Afghanistan or the, or the region, but for global security, and it caused 9-11, and, and uh, I, I do not have to go into what happened after 2001. And once again, right now, you have international terrorism returning to Afghanistan. And international terrorism this time around has an emboldened narrative. Right now, all of these terrorist groups from Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram in North Africa up to Lashkar Taiba in South Asia, they have all declared the Taliban as the leaders of the jihadist movement. After, on August 16th in their message to the Taliban, all of these Al-Qaeda affiliated groups, they said the Taliban have shown that the jihadists can become victorious. It has given them a narrative that US or NATO is in, invincible, that they can fight, they can uh, launch an insurgency until they bring their enemy to the negotiating table and to, uh, uh, to receive as much concessions uh, as they need and for them to receive legitimacy. How, the United States um, uh, during the Doha, uh, the so-called peace negotiation, gave the Taliban legitimacy, sitting uh, around the same table uh, with a terrorist regime, with a terrorist group, gave them legitimacy, and the Taliban are misusing that legitimacy today. So the whole threat of international terrorism inside Afghanistan will create external migration. It, uh, mass external migration towards Europe. Right now, the Taliban are distributing passports to all these foreign fighters, the 13,000 foreign fighters that I said. And these foreign fighters aren't, aren't receiving citizenship to stay in Afghanistan and build new lives. They're receiving citizenship. They're receiving passports in order to infiltrate into the West. So they're a, a challenge to Western security global security, and if the West or the glo uh, international community doesn't stay engaged in Afghanistan, doesn't address this problem, and doesn't strengthen the last remaining democratic forces in the country, then we might have uh, events like 9-11 repeat itself in the future, or much worse than that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. So, as we're running out of time, a last question to Greg. So, what should we do to avoid future similar disasters? What are the do's and don'ts of future similar missions? We have two minutes and something to... One to PS onto the question you asked Ali, if I may, in, in 10 seconds, which is there's a presumption that the, that the region around Afghanistan is going to remain the same. And you're already seeing with the difficulties that Imran Khan has in Pakistan that it's not going to remain the same. And there's a state of flux already. So. Whatever was the situation in August is not necessarily the situation uh, in March 
uh, and may not be, it may be completely different by the end of this year again still. So there are going to be a, re a series of renewed tensions. But what, what to do? I mean, the cynical answer is never to go. But the, the fact of the matter is that we are all human beings and we see the need, aside from the real politic instance of dealing with insecurity, we'll, we see the need to help individuals elsewhere. I do think we have to understand that these missions are very long term. And think of the different outcome if the US had made the commitment to keep a force akin to the force structure in South Korea, which is now 27,000 troops, over a very long period of time. I believe the outcome would have been dramatically different. I do think we, we tend in the international community to believe that single figures are the answer, that Ashraf Ghani was the answer. We tend to personify uh, these, 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 uh, these uh, circumstances, whereas in fact the answer lies in the health of overall institutions over the long term. And you have to build those institutions and it takes many years. If in 1973 the US had left South Korea, there's no, there's, there's very little clarity on what would have happened in South Korea without that long-term US commitment, or, 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 which, which has taken them 50 years beyond that to where they are today. So I think the answer is long-term, think things through from the finish, and don't try and create these countries in your own image. So uh, we've run out of time, so thank you, Greg, thank you, Ali, and thank you, thank you all for joining us. And I, as I would say, Slava Ukraina, I have to say uh, long live, not Afghanistan, but democratic Afghanistan. Okay. So thank you all.